All right, let's get started. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Patrick DeHere. I'm the residency director at Ascension St. Vincent, Vincent Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm also on the APMA Board of Trustees. And I have been the team podiatrist for the Indiana Pacers for about 29 years. So I'm uh, really uh, interested in, sport, in sports medicine. And sports medicine has been a part of my uh, practice for years, particularly basketball players, but uh, all types of sports medicine. It's not the main focus of my practice, but it's definitely something that I have an interest in. And that's why I wanted to put this lecture together. Uh, it's how do we deal with plantar fasciitis in the athlete? And then what is the evidence to help base our um, treatment on it? And let's take a look at this uh, today. My disclosures for this lecture. Several famous athletes have been sidelined by plantar fasciitis. Joe Kim Noah is a former NBA player, and he had this quote in an article when he was on the injured reserve list for plantar fasciitis. He said, plantar fasciitis sucks. It feels like you have needles underneath your feet while you're playing. You need to run, you need to jump, and you need to do a lot of things while you're playing basketball, so you don't want needles on your feet, right? Joe Kim Noah is absolutely right on his quote. Several players have been sideline for pretty extended periods of time with plantar fasciitis and it's, it's actually ruined some players careers the, this year one of the indiana pacers uh, best players was uh, was unable to play the last portion of the season because of plantar fasciitis so it is a very common injury amongst athletes when you take a look at the epidemiology of plantar fasciitis it's pretty striking. First, it affects about 10 to 15 percent, or about 10 percent of the general population during lifetime, and 15 percent of the uh, complaints requiring professional care. It accounts for approximately a million visit, physician visits per year, and treatment costs of more than 375 million per year in just the United States alone. So, that's good news for us uh, as podiatrists. That means we'll be continued to uh, be busy with our patients with plantar fasciitis. The incidence of lower extremity injuries in runners is estimated to range between four and a half and 10% with a prevalence of 5.2 to 17%. And plantar fasciitis compromises approximately 25% of all injuries in runners and 8% amongst injuries among those participating in, in sporting activities. And it's been reported as high as 31% in a group of runners. So it's a pretty significant running related injury. I'm a big why person. We, understanding why plantar fasciitis is occurring, I think, helps to guide the uh, treatment plan and um, <clears throat> allows us to use evidence-based uh, medicine to help get our athletes back on the court or the field uh, sooner and, and without pain. This article from JBJS in 2003 was a match case control study by Riddle. And it's a really high quality article because they used two, not only was it a match case control study, they used two controls for each subject, which is, is, is pretty, um, uh, pretty significant. They looked at the um, risk factors for plantar fasciitis and patients who had less than zero degrees of dorsiflexion on the involved limb had an odds ratio of 23.3 of developing plantar fasciitis. And it increased, the risk of plantar fasciitis increased as ankle joint dorsiflexion decreased in a dose type uh, response. So the, the tighter the posterior muscle group, the higher the risk for plantar fasciitis. Patel and DJ Vani have talked about plantar fasciitis and the association with uh, gastroc equinus. And they kind of broke it out to acute plantar fasciitis and chronic plantar fasciitis. I don't think that really matters so much, but the, the sort of bottom line is it's around 82, 83% of the patients with equinus are going to um, have an associated, or with plantar fasciitis are going to have an associated equinus deformity, whether it's isolated gastroc or gastroc soleal. This is a little more recent article by Nikaeli in Foot and Ankle International in 2017. And in this article, they had three groups of patients. One group had plantar fasciitis, one group had another foot and ankle pathology, and the other group had no pathology and realized as controls. And they used five degrees of dorsiflexion with the knee extended as their definition. 
in the group two that had other pathologies. They were pretty similar or pretty regularly uh, seen pathologies in, in a general foot and ankle clinic, as you can see on this uh, chart. The, this, the, the finding showed, again, it's very similar. I, and I, it's, I find it very reassuring when multiple authors come to the same conclusion uh, that 80% or so of the patients with plantar fasciitis had an underlying equinus. Other foot and ankle pathology was 45.3, and no foot and ankle pathology or the control group was uh, only 20%. So you can see how significant that is uh, in the plantar fasciitis group. And they, uh, their conclusion was a very strong association between gastroc equinus and plantar fasciitis, and it should be sought out early and treated. That's the key. When we're treating these patients or, or athletes with plantar fasciitis, we have to look for early and we've got to aggressively treat the equinus as part of their plantar fasciitis treatment. Um, otherwise, we're not going to get adequate resolution of the symptoms to help get these athletes back into their sports. This is a dissertation that was uh, written for looking at the risk factors amongst runners for plantar fasciitis. So both collegiate type runners and then just recreational runners. And there were two groups or a group of patients with plantar fasciitis and a control group that um, were in the study. And their demographics were relatively similar. Uh, some of the runners were elite runners, some were just sort of weekend runners. But the bottom line on this was that decreased dorsiflexion was a significant risk factor uh, for developing plantar fasciitis. And <clears throat> again, kind of like Riddle found, and, and again, this is the reassuring part when we're seeing multiple authors coming to the same conclusion that there's this dose type of response. So for each one degree loss of dorsiflexion, active range of motion increased the risk of plantar fasciitis by 14.6. Uh, and if you look at the uh, continuation of their conclusion that the longitudinal arch angle and the body mass index did not significantly affect plantar fasciitis risk. So normally athletes are, are not uh, considered obese by their BMI, but you know, that's one of the things that's pounded into our heads with uh, plantar fasciitis is it's, it's, it's weight related and, and really it's not. And if you look at some of the surgical treatment for plantar fasciitis, which we're not really going to talk about today in this, this lecture, but there's, there was a study done on patients with uh, elevated BMIs who had chronic refractory plantar fasciitis who went into surgery, had a gastroc recession performed, and their pain resolved. They got better, but their BMIs did not change. So, you know, is it plantar fasciitis? Is it Aquinas? Clearly, the literature is in the favor of Aquinas as a, the risk factor. And, and these are some of those articles I was talking about. Uh, it started back in 2010 uh, with the approach, to, instead of cutting the plantar fascia, fascia which we have done historically, uh, to just do a gastroc recession. And the FIC articles, the article I just mentioned that uh, looked at the patients with elevated BMI and an 82% success rate. But there's just article after article now, there's been up to 10. Uh, there's a newer article that has come out of, uh, after these, but and just a couple quotes from uh, some of the more recent articles. Uh, Mulan, Foot and Ankle International 2018, we believe a proximal medial gastroc recession should be preferred treatment for chronic cases of plantar heel pain that is non-responsive to non-operative treatment. Our belief is that inflammation is due to the stretch placed on the plantar fascia due to the gastroc equinus contracture at the beginning of the arch collapse. Uh, per the Grand Rapids Arch Collapse Model, Chaining Foot and Ankle International 2018. And the more recent article actually was a head-to-head -head comparison uh, of gastroc recession versus plantar fascia release. They actually had similar outcomes as far as patient success, but the authors very clearly stated in that article that the negative impact on the foot biomechanics of cutting the plantar fascia clearly throws the decision-making process into the favor of doing a gastroc recession. So if this is how we're treating it surgically by just doing a gastroc recession with article after article after article in well-established foot and ankle journals, then we should be also including that as part of our conservative treatment as well, because we can stretch the gastrocnemius or the gastroc soleus muscle group uh, non-surgically and accomplish the same thing. 
Jim Amos is a foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon who has written a lot about Aquinas and he used to be the team doctor for the Cincinnati Bengals. And he had this great quote that from one of his articles, he said, we are awakening to a new era of understanding of the mechanics and function of the human foot and ankle. And there's a simple, singular, usually silent and remote cause for the majority of non-traumatic acquired foot and ankle pathology. And mechanically, it creates cumulative damage of the foot and ankle through leverage forces. In short, and in this author's opinion, Aquinas is a primary mechanical common denominator that leads the majority of acquired non-traumatic foot and ankle problems by indirect leverage means as well as direct forces along the posterior chain. And there can be no more room for standard thinking that these resultant foot and ankle problems arise just because we are getting older or we are obese or they are just random or that Aquinas contracture is only part of the equation. Aquinas is the equation and I wholeheartedly agree with that. And he said that these things that, like, that we think cause pathology basically are just causal in relationship and have any, any, any if, direct relationship and the singular cause for most of the things that we treat as foot and ankle surgeons is contracture of the gastroc. And, and this is a really important point because you'll hear the naysayers and there are a few of them, not many, but there are a few. And unfortunately, most of them come within the podiatry profession, which is um, disheartening for me. Um, the, the gastroc, which in time causes incremental damage to the foot and ankle. So what that means is, there's this pathological force occurring and, and just because you see a certain patient at a point in time and they haven't reached a tipping point where they've gone into a symptomatic stage, it doesn't mean that there isn't abnormal stress and strain occurring on the foot because there is. And when you understand the biomechanics of equinus, you, you can then appreciate this statement a little more thoroughly. So the why of the why, which is really getting back to the biomechanics of equinus, why does it wreak so much havoc? This is nothing new. I mean, this is not revolutionary. It's been around for over a hundred years. The very first, first textbook written on foot and ankle was Diseases and Deformities of the Foot by John Joseph Nutt in 1913. He talked about loading the gastroxyleal complex and that causing a strain on the plantar supportive tissues. And that is plantar fasciitis. He also said, as you tighten the gastroxyleal complex, you get a lowering of the dome, which is what? flattening of the arch or pronation syndrome. Both of those things are directly uh, related to plantar fasciitis. Thordson did a great article where they looked at cadavers and they pulled on different tendons to see which things elevated the arch and which things flattened the arch. And in the sagittal plane that was evaluated by looking at the talo first metatarsal angle, the, the primary arch deformer by far was the Achilles tendon. So the more you pulled on the Achilles tendon, the more the arch flattened. The primary arch augmenter is the windlass mechanism. It's greater than all the extrinsic tendons from the leg onto the foot combined by far in the sagittal plane. In the transverse plane, it's a little bit different. It's again, the Achilles tendons are by far the primary arch deformer, but this is where the posterior tip becomes more of an arch augmenter. With ev but even with uh, continued loading of the tendon, the wind last mechanism also augments the arch in the transverse plane. Jeff Christensen wrote a really historic series of articles in the late 1990s, early 2000s, where they took cadaver feet and they put sensors on the first ray. So the first met, first cuneiform, the vicula and the talus, and they did different things to the foot to see what happened to the medial column of the foot, which is such an important component from a functional standpoint of the foot. So the first part of the study looked at the role of the proneus longus. And as you pull in the proneus longus more and more and more and increase the load, the medial column uh, in the frontal plane shows increasing eversion of the first metatarsal, first cuneiform and navicula. In the transverse plane, increasing adduction of the first met, abduction of the cuneiform and navicula. And then in the sagittal plane, you see increasing plantar flexion of the first met, first cuneiform, with reciprocal dorsiflexion of the naviculum. And that's because of the pull of the proneus longus coming around the fifth metatarsal and inserting to the plantar lateral first metatarsal cuneiform joint. And essentially, the proneus longus, under the influence of the proneus longus, the medial column functions as a series of links. And the proneus longus is 
everting or locking the medial column of the foot into the central column of the foot to stabilize the mid-tarsal joint. There's also a reciprocal supination in, in late mid stance or the, what I, I prefer using rockers, the, the second rocker, late in the second rocker, when the peroneus longus is active. And that the peroneus longus in plantar fascia uh, via the windlass mechanism prepare the foot for propulsion. So what is happening is the plantar fascia and the peroneus longus are converting the foot from a mobile adapter, which is important at heel strike to absorb pressure and shock in, in, in the first rocker and then in the second rocker when the pronus longus and posterior tib and intrinsic muscles fire, they're helping to change that from a mobile adapter to a rigid lever to propulse off of before the third rocker starts when the gastroxyleal complex fires in, the, in late in the second rocker and continues to fire into the third rocker. So in part five of their study, they looked at, the, at what happens as you pull on the Achilles tendon more and more. So as you pull on the Achilles tendon with increasing load, that frontal plane action of the peroneus longus was dampened. So it wasn't able to fire and evert that medial column of the foot into the central column of the foot to lock the metarsal joint, uh, leading to unlocking and hypermobility or instability, particularly with flattening of the arch and the sagittal plane of the neoform joint. And if you think about and notice when, as you start to look at x-rays after x-ray after x-ray, particularly of significantly flat feet, you'll notice a navicular cuneiform sag. And it's always there. And, and I find it interesting that we really have never asked why. Well, why is that NC sag always present on these patients with really severe flat feet? And it's because of this. It's because of the association of equinus and, and uh, pruning the foot structure. And, and so specifically what's occurring is plantar flexion of the talus and navicula with dorsiflexion of the first cuneiform and first metatarsal. And Amos in one of his last papers he wrote, used slow motion photography to, to watch patients walk and, and took uh, individual uh, snapshots uh, as they were actively walking to really look at the foot uh, frame by frame and what's going on. And you see the first, this is a patient with posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. So this is a, a foot that uh, is not functioning appropriately, but we see the first rocker, the second rocker, and the third rocker on the picture on the left, which is the second rocker of gait where the foot is flat like this, but you see a sag and a fourth rocker developing and right at where Jeff Christensen said it would, it's at the navicular cuneiform joint. And then as the, the gastroxyl complex fires late into the third or late into the second rocker going into the third rocker to start to bring the heel up off the ground, you can see the pronounced downward deflection of the navicular cuneiform joint in that uh, photo on the right. Amos showed that this only lasted for about a tenth of a second. But the problem is, is how many steps do you take a day and over how many periods of years? Eventually, that's going to lead to a pathological situation. And it's because that there's this uncult, the occult, unrecognized overuse of, of imbalance that leads to damage of the foot and ankle. We know from studies that as the tension on the gastroxyleal aquinas increases, the tension on the plantar fascia mirrors it and goes up in just a direct proportion to the amount of pressure going through the gastroxyleal complex. So that's why you can cut the calf, you can lengthen the calf muscle and reduce the strain on the plantar fascia surgically. That's why that procedure surgically works. And Chung said the plantar fascia was found to have be an important arch supporting structure which sustained high tension during weight bearing an increase in Achilles, ten, Achilles tendon load resulted in reductions of arch height and increase in plantar fascia tensions. The Achilles tendon was, load was found to have about two times the straining effect on the plantar fascia than body weight alone. Again, body weight versus uh, function and tightness of the gastroxyleal complex, and clearly that's what's happening. Chung said lengthening or tension release of the Achilles tendon, especially in subjects with tight calf muscles, and Achilles tendon may be beneficial in terms of plantar fascia stress relief. So now that we understand the mechanics of what's happening, it's important to understand the proper evaluation of Aquinas so that we can identify it 
in the majority of these patients with heel pain that we're seeing, particularly our athletic patients. And it's really changed a lot over the last couple of years. And it started with this article from GAT, which was a pilot investigation that looked at the static, um, the relationship between the static measurement or uh, uh, the biomechanics of running, basically, and their activity level. Uh, the problem with equinus is, and, and how we evaluate for it is there's a lot of confusion in the literature. There have been 23 different methods described uh, in the literature to measure equinus, and that leads to the confusion that surrounds equinus. And the historic way of measuring using Root's method can measure difference between eight and a half and 10 degrees, depending on the position of the foot. The historic way of measuring by root, where we put the subtalar joint in neutral and lock the metatarsal joint, which has been uh, a pair, which has been a sort of a mantra within the podiatric profession since the 1970s and late 60s, has been shown really to have poor inter and intra rater reliability. What does yield consistent results is supinating the entire foot to lock the mid-tarsal joint to only 2.5 degrees of motion, uh, which is considered clinically insignificant. So when you supinate the foot and dorsiflex the ankle, the amount of dorsiflexion that you're measuring is not going in through the mid-tarsal joint. It's only really occurring at the hind foot. Uh, the ankle and the subtalar joint, which is really what we're looking to identify, and that yields more inter and intra rater reliability. So if you look at these pictures here on the on this right side of this slide, the top left is dorsiflexing the foot with the foot pronated, which is, is doesn't really tell us very much. The top right is the root method, putting the subtalar joint in neutral and locking the metatarsal joint, then dorsoflexing also does not tell us very much. The, the center bottom picture is, you can see the examiner supinating the forefoot and the hind foot to lock the metatarsal joint. Now all the true motion is gonna be occurring in the hind foot at the ankle and the subtalar joint. Uh, and, and we're removing any kind of false information from the metatarsal joint. Uh, by doing this, and then we're going to dorsiflex the ankle. And we're seeing this in other articles where the examiners are supinating the foot as they're dorsiflexing the ankle. Here's one that looked at Achilles tendon tightness and lower extremity injuries in children. And then here's another article, and you can see in picture B and C, uh, where they're supinating the foot as they're dorsiflexing the ankle. And this was an article that looked at gastroc recessions for the treatment of mechanical metatarsalgia. So it's really important as we're measuring to supinate the foot. Now that we understand how to uh, evaluate it, well, one more study on that. And again, this is the whole point of multiple authors coming to the same conclusion. Dayton looked at this in JFAS in 2017, and they wanted to compare something radiographically to what we're doing clinically. And they thought the best way to look at this radiographically was measuring the tibio tailor angle. And they put the foot in supination, pronation, and neutral and measured the tibial tailor angle. Then they measured angle to dorsiflexion where the foot supinated, neutral, and pronated, and looked to see if there were any differences. And, and essentially, radiographically, there was no difference. It, it was stayed the same. The actual bony alignment stayed the same. However, clinically, the, there was a significant difference. There's a 13 degree, degree, degree difference between supinated and pronated, and about an eight to nine degree difference between neutral and uh, supinated. So uh, Dayton reiterated what Gat has said is that there's this potential for error, and that's even using the historic method of root that we've used for decades uh, when we put the subtalar in neutral and lock the metatarsal joint. And they recommended supinating the foot as a more reliable position for measuring ankle joint. It's really foot and ankle or hind foot uh, range of motion and propose it as the potential standard. So now that we understand how to measure it, we can talk about defining it. And the, the key question is, okay, what's happening dynamically and how does that relate to what we're measuring statically? So specifically what's happening at the end of the second rocker and as we go into the third rocker of gait and how does that correlate to what we measure in our non-weight bearing exam of these patients? And we know in that phase of gait, around the 50% cycle of gait, that 
in order to move the body from behind the foot and forward over the top of the foot that's planted on the ground, the ankle has to bend at least 10 degrees and maybe up to 20. Uh, 10 degrees is probably a conservative uh, amount. Uh, so between 10 and 20 degrees is well accepted. And GAD in this study, and it was a pilot investigation, so I hope that they published the results of the remaining portion of the study. They use this dynamic gait analysis system by, by Viacon, which is used in, in a lot of uh, gait analysis uh, research. They had two groups. Group A had ankle joint dorsiflexion less than negative five, and group B had uh, negative five to zero. And what they found was in the patients with negative five or less was only 4.4 degrees of motion occurring at the end of the second rocker prior to the third rocker where it needs to be between 10 and 20. On the negative five to zero group, it was 13.9. So that's still kind of at the lower end, but definitely more within the realm of normality. And there was a significant difference between those two groups. So GAP first said it's just incom you know, incomprehensible that we accepted this definition by root without ever verifying it, number one. Number two, they also said that the axis of the goniometer is not an exact measurement because it, the ankle axis is not straight transverse. It goes from dorsal, distal, medial to plantar proximal lateral. And, and because those axes are not parallel, they're not necessarily translatable. So, but it's the most practical way we have to measure ankle joint dorsiflexion in the office. So again, the axis, just understand that they're not parallel to each other. So they're not, it's not an exact measurement, but it's the best thing that we have in, in the clinic. So GAT essentially has recommended negative five with the foot supinated and the ankle joint dorsiflex with the knee extended. Equinus is very common in patients with foot pathology, and this has been verified by uh, multiple authors, but Jasper did probably the largest study and they measured with uh, three different ways with this Iowa ankle range of motion device. They also used a goniometer and they also just eyeballed it in comparing patients with a foot and ankle problem versus a control group. And there was a significant amount of uh, difference between their ankle joint dorsiflexion with the patients having a foot and ankle pathology having less dorsiflexion than the control group. So how do we treat plantar fasciitis? And particularly in our athletes, we really wanna be evidence-based and uh, the Journal of Orthopedic Sports Physical Therapy every few years produces a uh, grading system for treatment of plantar fasciitis, which is really a good article. I'm, I've been waiting for the newer revised version to come out. I'm not sure exactly when it's coming out, but they give everything a, 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 a grade based on the research or evidence. So A, strong evidence, B is moderate, C is weak, D is conflicting, E is theoretical foundational evidence, and F is just expert opinion. So first, stretching received an A, and as you would expect. And uh, if we can also stretch the plantar fascia, it's very uh, helpful to this to do this as well. Some people say, well, oh, you can't stretch the plantar fascia, and actually you can uh, stretch the plantar fascia. So stress something that stretches the plantar fascia and the gastroxylo complex receives an A. Uh, stretching is an interesting topic. The, the manual stretching or the runner stretch works, but the problem is, is compliance and doing it correctly. The literature is very unclear on how long you need to stretch each day, but let's just say it's a half hour based on the best literature that's available currently. It's a half hour per day per leg, and it takes at least eight to 12 weeks to fully stretch. And the problem is with technique, and it's really difficult to do the runner stretch correctly. And here you can, this, in this picture, you can see bending too much at the hips, the back knee being bent, and then the back heel coming up off the ground. And finally, you have to stretch in supination instead of pronation. So there's just so many ways to do this wrong and, and very limited um, a way to do it correctly. And, and the amount of time and for the duration just makes it not practical. Night splints also received an A uh, for stretching. There are problems with night splints. So if you wear a night splint to sleep, you have to sleep with your knee bent. So it's really not stretching the gastroc. It's gonna help the soleus, but it's not gonna help the gastroc. And the gastroc is usually the, the tight one. 
And if you just have a patient wear a night splint and put their leg out or they're going to do something like on the left or on the right where they're, it's not a bad uh, attempt, but it's just not good enough. You can still see some flexion of the knee. It's uncomfortable to fully extend your knee and to have your uh, ankle dorsiflex. You almost have to be forced to do it. Dorsal nice splints are worse <coughs> for all the same reasons, plus they allow the forefoot to plantar flex relative to the rear foot. And uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago about the importance of also stretching the plantar fascia, so it's really not doing that. Ideally, we use a brace that goes above the knee to lock the knee to extension. We use something that has controllable hinges to, to uh, allow our treatment to mirror what we're measuring clinically, so where the patient is. We don't want to overstretch them and cause Achilles tendonitis type problems. So having the treatment uh, be in line with what we're seeing clinically and then also allowing us to progress the patient through different stages of stretching to get them to stretch out in a safe manner that's not going to cause a secondary problem. And then it's important to stretch in supination so that we're locking the metarsal joint. We do not want that dorsiflexion moment occurring through the metarsal joint. We want to isolate it to the hind foot. So supinating the foot will lock the metarsal joint and allow that dorsiflexion force that the brace is going to be generating to occur uh, at the hind foot, number one. Number two, uh, we're doing this by engaging the windlass mechanism, uh, particularly the hallux, and that's also going to help stretch the plantar fascia. And then finally, as you supinate the subtalar joint, you externally rotate the tibia, which helps to lock the knee into full extension. And, and, and that's really important because the gastroc what's tight most of the time. So having that, leap, that knee locked out into extension as we're dorsiflexing the ankle is really important. And that's called the screw home mechanism. If you have a, an athlete that has right heel pain, you know, should you check or stretch the left side? And the answer is yes. And this is really clearly documented from the pinnation angles or the muscle fiber angles of the muscles of the lower extremity. They're always the same on the right and left. And studies that have uh, started with the starting point on ankle joint dorsiflexion and then as they stretch patients, always shows that it's the same right and left. And I have a paper that's gonna be published in March in JAPMA that um, looks at the bilaterality of Aquinas. And again, there's always, they're always the same unless there's a reason for them not to be the same. Particularly in athletes and running based sports, this is an important concept, um, uh, but also regular patients too. As we talked before about how the gastroxyloidal complex causes a downward force through the navicular cuneiform joint, if we make an orthotic as part of our treatment for plantar fasciitis and we have this untreated equinus deformity that's driving the arch down, the arch supports trying to push the arch up, we develop this orthotic equinus war that I call, I call it. And it's really, what happens is the patients come in and they say the arch is too high and the arch isn't too high, the orthotic arch is not too high. It's just that the calf and the orthotic are fighting each other and the foot's the battleground. So you have to get that calf muscle stretched out so that the foot can then accept the control that it requires to function more ab uh, to function more normally. And if you can remove that deforming force of the leg onto the foot, then the foot is able to uh, have an orthotic, a well-made orthotic, give it the proper support. It's not that when they come in and say that the arch is too high, it's not that you took a bad cast or the lab just randomly made the arch too high on the medial aspect. That's not what happened. It's that you have this, this um, uh, deformity from above that's influencing the foot down below. Shoe drop is an important concept, particularly in athletes too. Uh, if you have a, a runner, for example, and they're wearing a shoe drop of 14 or 16 millimeters, and they're in those shoes all the time, even walking, they're, they're, they're fighting your treatments like wearing a mini high heel. Uh, it's important to get patients uh, shoes in line with your therapy for stretching or dealing with their equinus deformity. So I like to have patients in a four to eight millimeter drop shoe, which is usually Saucony or Brooks. And then once they get stretched out, if you want to transition or they want to transition to a zero drop shoe, that's fine, like an Ultra or a Hoka. The, the, the problem is you can't go to a zero drop shoe if you're not stretched out because that will cause Achilles tendonitis, metatarsalgia, potentially stress fractures. Uh, we saw this with barefoot running and, 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 and all that occurred with that. 
but you don't want you don't want the shoe to be fighting your stretching for the equinus uh, when you're actively treating it. So have a discussion about shoe drop. It's important. So the conservative management I recommend with uh, stretching for equinus in athletes or even just the general population is I have them wear the brace that I prefer for one hour a day seated upright to also stretch the hamstrings. That's really important because hamstring tightness has been associated with equinus uh, and it's part of that posterior chain that just tightens as we age as part of the normal process of aging. I stretch both legs simultaneously until the deformity is, uh, uh, is resolved. If you only stretch one side and not the other, if you only stretch on the symptomatic side and not the asymptomatic side, if it's only a unilateral problem, what happens is you're going to create a functional limb length inequality and in one and, and, and you're going to cause back and hip problems. Also, I stretch them. The brace I use has three settings on it or three hinges, hinge points. So I keep each patient at each um, part of the um, brace for a month at each setting of the brace for a month. So it takes about eight to 12 weeks to fully stretch them out. And uh, once they're stretched, they're, uh, you have to keep them stretched. So you have to transition from what I call active static stretching to maintenance therapy and maintenance therapy for a, a, a serious athlete like a real athlete whether it's a college athlete or a professional athlete or you know a serious runner or triathlete it is going to be probably uh, three nights per week for an hour so instead of using it seven nights per week for an hour or seven days per week for an hour i have them use it like monday wednesday the brace monday wednesday friday Next is manual therapy. So this is where you can get physical therapy involved in the treatment of, of your uh, athletes. It does receive an A as well. Taping, I'm a big taper. I love using tape for the initial treatment of plantar fasciitis and, and it's also received an A. And, and the reason why is because when you have a really sore heel and you try to go right into a supportive orthotic, uh, like a functional type orthotic, a sore heel and a uh, semi-rigid or even a rigid orthotic really aggravate it. So you have to calm things down first and then go into the orthotic. I always tell patients it's a two-step process. So taping is a really good way to support the plantar fascia and the arch extrinsically without aggravating the sore heel. So I'll tape patients for three, two, three weeks usually, and then, then hopefully transition them into an orthotic. Orthotics also receive an A. In this article, they didn't really differentiate over-the-counter versus custom, and I clearly think the custom orthotics are superior to over-the-counter, but you can find decent over-the-counter orthotics, particularly in patients who have, uh, do not have insurance coverage for orthotics or they can't afford custom orthotics. Usually in, in a, an athlete, it's not gonna to be too much of an issue to, for them to get a custom type orthotic. Uh, for basketball players, which is, uh, I work with a lot of professional basketball players, I like uh, uh, something that has a deep heel cup, uh, 18 millimeters or so, I like a high medial flange, and uh, a multi-density type device with a soft EVA arch fill, and uh, the forefoot needs to be well padded. Basketball players are very picky about orthotics, it can't be too rigid, so you want to sneak in some control uh, usually I'll do semi-flexible, semi-rigid, depending on the foot structure for the shell. And that's usually based with the labs on the, the weight of the patient on how thick that shell is. Then it's just a polypropylene shell. But then if you have a soft EVA arch fill, it's going to help with shock absorption. And also the heel uh, 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 post needs to be relatively soft material. But and then a lot of padding in the front. You can see multi-density layer, uh, different layers. Uh, within the forefoot on this. And this is a perforated EVA top cover, which also kind of gives some breathability to the device. Other treatments, now we're starting to get into lower level uh, treatments. Electrotherapy received a grade D. Low level laser therapy received a C. Phonophoresis received a C. Ultrasound also received a C. Footwear modifications received a C. Education and counseling for weight loss received an E.
Therapeutic exercises in neuromuscular re-education received an F. Dry needling also received an F, although it certainly is becoming more and more popular with heel pain. Extracorporeal shock wave received an I, and it's interesting that it received an I for incomplete because there's actually quite a bit of data on shockwave therapy for heel pain. And I'm a fan of shockwave therapy for heel pain. I think it has definitely an, a, a role in heel pain. Kind of the bottom line study on, the bottom line research on shockwave therapy is that it works about half the time. And uh, the other things though to consider are that there's really no downside to doing it. You're not burning any bridges. There's really no limitations of activity that are involved. And this is particularly important with athletes, number, number two. And then number three, when it does work, if you look at the bottom, the recurrence rate is very low. So when shockwave does help, and I find it as an adjunctive thing, it's not by itself. It's going to be used like in conjunction with stretching for equinus and orthotics. Uh, when, but when this does work, it stays better. Uh, so that's really the only downside is, is it may not work. Uh, it is uncomfortable having it done. Uh, I have a shockwave machine in my office. Usually what I'll do is have my patients who I'm doing shockwave on take a, a pain medication about an hour before they have it done. It makes it tolerable that way for them to do it. But again, I think it does have a role in plantar fasciitis especially. Steroid injections received an eye, which is really interesting. Um, and if you think about steroid injections for athletes uh, and you look at the harms that can be associated with those, you know, the one we always sort of most fear is rupture of the plantar fascia. That certainly can happen, but I believe that's relatively rare. The thing that I have seen more commonly and that can be even more problematic is subcutaneous fat atrophy. And I've had some really serious runners, triathletes, where they've been to other treating physicians and they have received five, six steroid injections. And you see their fat pad just gone on their heel. And that is a really devastating problem when you lose the fat pad on the, on the calcaneus. It it's, becomes really complicated to try to reestablish that. And, and multiple injections in that same area will take its toll on that fat pad. So I would, I, I would probably be very reluctant to, to do actual steroid injection in a professional athlete. Clear, clearly the risk of rupture and their activity level is a concern, but also the fat pad atrophy. Uh, this is a really good article in the British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2016 that looked at all the injection therapies for plantar fasciitis. And they kind of ran the gamut from steroid injections all the way down to um, Botox injections. And um, they kind of broke out the categories into uh, short-term, intermediate, and, uh, and then uh, midterm results. And um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go through each one of those individually. We'll just kind of highlight the uh, findings. But uh, one of the things with the injections, a lot of the injections cause pain while they're getting it. It's pretty uncomfortable to inject the plantar fascia. And the, the interesting reason is why it's, it doesn't matter what you're injecting to the plantar fascia, it hurts because there's no space for the fluid to go. So you're, whatever you're injecting, whether it's PRP or amniotic fluid or a steroid injection or Botox, the fluid uh, has to create a space within a very dense structure of the plantar fascia. That's why it's uncomfortable. Uh, and causes some pain. And also you can have post-injection pain as well. But the findings of the study were um, amniotic membrane for short term seemed to have really good results. And we're talking uh, uh, more about the amniotic injections for plantar fasciitis. Uh, Botox uh, also showed good results, but I have seen and heard of very few people utilizing Botox for plantar fasciitis. And then uh, PRP injections really didn't have much uh, to verify their use for plantar fasciitis. There's a really good article on Foot and Ankle International published by um, uh, a group of podiatrists. It's a multi-center study, and I was really proud that they were able to get this from Foot and Ankle International. And they looked at the uh, use of one single amniotic injection for plantar fasciitis, and they had a treatment group and a control group, and here you can see their demographics. But their outcome measurements were 
BAS pain scale, uh, which was significantly better after three months with just one amniotic injection and then secondary outcome or foot function and um, also was significantly better. And if I had an athlete that had significant plantar fasciitis that wasn't responding to sort of standard therapy, I like oral steroids. I'll use those a lot to start with. But if they weren't getting better with taping and stretching and, and oral steroids and maybe manual therapy and some other forms of physical therapy, one of the things that I would do pretty quickly would be an amniotic injection. Now, with an amniotic injection, you don't have to worry about those complications that you can see with a steroid injection. I think ultimately, and it's starting to happen, insurance companies are starting to pay for amniotic injections here and there. I think amniotic injections, the literature is coming in very strong for, for amniotic injections. I think it's going to surpass and eventually be the preferred treatment for plantar fasciitis over steroid injections as it becomes more readily available and um, insurance companies start to pay for it. Uh, if you would like a PDF of the lecture, this is a QR code. All you have to do is hold your camera up and, and you're, you should get a link to my uh, or uh, my uh, PDF of this lecture from my Google Drive. If you have any questions, there's my email. I'll be happy to answer any questions for you. Also, if you have questions while you're on here live with me, I'll be glad to answer those. Uh, there is a question uh, bar that you can uh, ask questions on. Sorry about the little glitch with my internet but I will post this on my YouTube channel if you would like to watch it later also or refer your uh, classmates. We're kind of doing a little experiment with doing this. Yep, I was asked to go back to the QR code. Let me pull back up here. There's the QR code. I'll leave that up for a second for you to uh, download the PDF. And you can just type in questions in the Q&A section if you'd like to ask a question. All right, everybody have a great day. Uh, thank you for joining this morning. Sorry about the glitch with my internet. Uh, and like I said, I'll post this on my YouTube if you wanna let your classmates know. And please spread the word. We're, I'm trying to see the interest. I'm trying to gauge the, the interest level amongst third and fourth year podiatry students. And uh, if there is interest working with APMSA, uh, I know pretty much everybody in the profession, I can put together a pretty amazing lecture series if, if people are interested, if there's enough interest, but I'm kind of using myself as a guinea pig here to get things started and to see if it's uh, something that you, you would like. And if it is, then I can start to assemble a pretty uh, amazing group of speakers. All right, thank you very much.